Welcome everybody. We are fortunate today to have two surety presidents of the top five sureties. On my right, immediate right, is Tim Michael Jeske, who is president of Liberty Mutual Surety. And I know he is always impressed when I say his name correctly. Absolutely, yeah. Matt. <laughs> I, try, I saw the nod, so thank you. And then to my further right is Steve Haney, who is president of Chubb Surety. When we did our last chat, sure chat as we call that, um, it was June 3rd of 2020. We were remote, as you would imagine. Today, we're fortunate. We are in person and um, we're able to have a fireside chat with a fireplace that is not lit, but is by a fireplace. <laughs> I always like to just let people know when, when you when they're the top 100 of surety writers, um, there's the list that comes out every year. And um, the top five sureties, we were just discussing this earlier before we went on video, um, are in order and it changes slightly, but today it's Liberty Mutual Surety, then Travelers, then CNA, then Zurich, and Chubb are the top five. And they represent about 55% of the entire surety marketplace. I'd like to just put that in context so we know who we're talking about. And one of the reasons I invited uh, both Steve and Tim um, to come is because they represent a large chunk of the surety industry globally. One thing I'd like to add, we did last time, we decided to make a donation. We thought there's a good opportunity and inviting um, our free speakers. Um, so we're going to make another donation like we did last time to both Feeding America in the US, and we have a Canadian office, so we're also going to donate to Food Bank Canada. Uh, we know the food banks are, um, are struggling out there, and we're sitting here in the winter time in Philadelphia, right before Christmas, and we know they're especially challenged. So we're going to offer that um, from Rosenberg and Parker. But back to our program. Um, before we called the program um, Sure Chat Commercial Surety, A Cautionary Tale. Um, today, I guess we'll call it Reflection of the Surety Industry 2020 through 2022, because we're sitting here two and a half years later and we can reflect back on where we have been with COVID, the pandemic, and all the other things that are, have gone on in the last two and a half years that affected um, the economy affected specifically the surety industry. Um, there's a, a sports show I watch and um, they talk about where Colin was right, where Colin was wrong. So yeah. we're gonna do that. There's plenty of both um, of, of what the predictions were from Steve and Tim uh, because there's no magic crystal ball, but, um, but they, they certainly got her a lot right. And, um, and then there were things that just always surprise us uh, in the industry of how things actually yeah, turn out. Absolutely. So with that, I just ran through all the questions and saw um, what I asked, how they were answered. So I'll, I'll, I, I'll remind you again what, what I asked. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll kind of give you hints on how you answered it. And then you could tell us what you see and what changed um, and, and how the future looks. So we'll touch on all of that. We also, We'll touch on not only commercial, but we'll also touch on contract surety. It's still it's a very important part of their business and our business, and so we want to make sure we we touch on both as best we can. And the first question I asked you out of the gates back in June 3rd of 2020 was, are you or were you bullish or bearish on the surety markets? You both, I mean, you're optimists, so um, you uh, you were both fairly bullish on the surety industry. Um, and Steve, I would say you said you were opportunistic um, in some of, of what you were seeing out there as, as far as um, uh, areas that you could grow and, right. um, and, and help clients and take yeah. advantage of the market. And, um, and yeah. so I, I guess I'd ask you, where are you today? Bearish, bullish on the surety industry and maybe on the economy as a whole? So on the surety industry, I'm still uh, cautiously optimistic, right? I would tell you, and I say that because if you take to both segments, uh, commercial, you know, there are, you know, some headwinds with rising interest rates that will, you know, obviously affect, you know, companies that, you know, have to refinance the next few years um, and their, their businesses are challenged. 
um, you know, that could just be enough just to kind of cause some, what I'll call, you know, just some pain and some and increased delinquencies and bankruptcies. But also, you know, private equity will slow down because they're not going to leverage up as much because it costs, capital costs more. And then when you look at the construction industry, you know, clearly supply chain uh, labor issues are, you know, strong. I mean, they're, you know, they're hurting. They're not necessarily positive. But you also have the federal government, you know, stimulating the environment, right? So I think that's a little bit of an offset. So I think for the next two years, I think the construction industry will do well. And um, the commercial, the corporate segment, you know, we're just, you know, paying attention to it. Um, I mean, when we go back, Matt, you know, at the time when we did our first one, energy market was like unraveling because they were going, you know, you know, WTI was negative and people couldn't get rid of it. Now today, you know, fast forward two years, completely different circumstances. So I think as you, we underwrite, and I do think the industry does a good job of underwriting, you know, you know they'll balance out all the headwinds uh, and try to come up with, you know, what I'll call cautiously, you know, optimistic you know, way forward. I'm pretty positive about the about the industry. Like Steve said, there's certainly some economic um, headwinds out there with uh, the debt, uh, cost of debt certainly rising. Inflation, um, you know, probably a little bit more than transitory, but it, it, it seems as though that, uh, that, that the, at least in the United States, the, the Fed has that, uh, has that under control. You know, you, you, you look at the, um, uh, you know, the financial situation of the U.S. consumer um, and pretty liquid from the standpoint of, of uh, where they would normally be in a kind of a downturn or recessionary environment. So pretty optimistic. There's a lot of resiliency in the, uh, in the, in the U.S. economy. Um, you know, the cost of debt, like, it's, like we talked about, will be, be a little bit of a challenge. But, um, you know, if inflation is really under control, uh, I think you, you'll start to see interest rates start to go down uh, pretty quickly. So, um, all in all, I, I, I really like the resiliency of the U.S. economy, and I think our, uh, the surety industry will benefit from that. Uh, the second question I threw at you was um, the current economic conditions and did it change your underwriting at the time? And, and you alluded to this a little, I think, in your first answer, Steve. We talked about how two and a half months into the pandemic, um, airlines had, you know, had reduced um, their revenue reduced dramatically as they didn't have anyone flying or, or many. Cruise lines went almost to zero, right? Mm -hmm. Companies that we bond. <clears throat> yep. And then oil prices, of course, as you also said, yep. went to zero or negative in some cases, which was, was crazy. So how did it turn out for, um, I, I know that's a loaded question, no, but uh, for your clients, um, maybe mm -hmm. just on the commercial side and then the contract side, how did it turn out and where did where were the failures and or did it all sort of just work out? You know what, Matt? So there was obviously there was an enormous amount of anxiety in the first few months of the pandemic before we had uh, vaccinations to sort of alleviate some of the, that anxiety. So when you go back and you look at it um, and you hit on what I would say, you know, kind of key area, like first the cruise lines, they did have to lever up because they did go to zero. And, um, you know, they'll still struggle to, you know, deleverage. Um, you know, their demand is coming back, so they'll start to generate operating revenues and be able to do that, but it'll take time. Um, airlines, they rebounded quite quickly uh, just because, you know, people were tired of being kind of confined. And it seems during the pandemic where people were consuming, you know, goods and you know, now they're going for services. So an airline and travel is one of them. So ultimately what happened was, um, and nobody knew, you know, the vaccines were on the horizon. Uh, I didn't see any high profile fares, failures, excuse me, but what you did see is the market reacted very positively by, you know, the lending institutions felt like these are good business models and they're just, you know, suffering right now under unusual circumstances. So we're gonna continue to lend to them. And then what'll happen is when the circumstances kind of go back to normal, their business models will work. That's that's what I think. And then the ones where the business models weren't good, they they weren't able to attract the capital, and they ended up some failed for sure. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. And I'd say if you look at the the, the retail sector, it'd yeah. be a good exactly a good example of that. And that wasn't that was a trend that was 
developing anyhow. You know, so from a, I'd say from an underwriting standpoint, the retail sector was an area that uh, had already been, um, you know, I think companies were pretty cautious in that retail sector because you were seeing just a fundamental change in how people and how people buy. So the the uh, uh, the pandemic accelerated that a little bit, but it the outcome is probably pretty much what uh, what everybody expected it yep. to be and and uh, and we're prepared for it you know you saw a little bit of noise in in the um, uh, energy sector mm -hmm. uh, but hey you know what in in any period of time the the, the weakest seg uh, yeah, companies within right. a sector uh, have some challenges and but it, it wasn't nearly what uh, at least we anticipated yeah. to see a much higher yeah. uptick in losses it was kind of a normal Loss activity that you would that you would see anyhow. So uh, I wouldn't say there was anything that um, uh, was really driven by the by the pandemic. Maybe a few things, like I said, with retail that accelerated, you know, some of the the the, the problems, but uh, nothing unexpected. Yeah. Yeah, I think exactly. I think the concern in the industry was the companies that were maybe teetering, and I think you might have said this at that time. You were just worried they were just going to push to the brink and. And that would, yeah, that would be the catalyst to end it. You know, and, and who would have known what kind of uh, government intervention that yes, we saw? That's right, you, right. you know, and and that was it's unprecedented um, that, that you saw that that amount of liquidity come into the to the market. So it did yeah, provide it a good lifeline that's for right. some of those uh, industries that we just that, that Steve talked about, especially in the hospitality sector that that uh, that, that were impacted real significantly by. Basically, having no customers that they could uh, that they could right. serve. Right. In fact, I have that later. But you're right. The um, the PPP loans. Yeah. Um, they called them loans for a while, which was a concern, right? As yeah. the industry, do they do they have to pay it back? Are they not going to? Are they going to forgive it? How is that going to work out? And I think that was a big discussion, particularly on the contract side. That's right. How is that going to affect your customers? That's right. And and what happened in the end, Steve? With well, ultimately, uh, and there was a lot of like, again uncertainty exactly how it was going to play out. The money, you know, moved from the federal government into the, you know, the hands of the clients through the banks, um, which helped sort of, you know, buoy, you know, basically balance them out at a time where the things were slowing down. And then there became some uncertainty as to whether or not they were going to have to repay it and whether or not they took it maybe inappropriately. So some people went so far as to take the money and they gave it back. But ultimately, as if, you know, as we got further into it, the government became more forgiving and then just, you know, you were able to forgive it. So you saw a lot of that loan become equity in companies. Yeah, and and if you you know one thing I'll add to what Steve said, if you look at the beneficiaries of those PPP loans, the construction sector uh, was the largest yeah. beneficiary at about right. thirteen or fourteen percent of the total amount of PPP loan money that went in. So yeah, That's when right. you look at the contract surety segment, uh, it clearly benefited from uh, from some pretty substantial liquidity uh, that they had access to. Mm -hmm. We also saw at that time sweeping downgrades we did. With, yeah. with those industries we talked about and others, whether it's retail, you know, restaurants, airlines, um, airline, airline manufacturers, right? Yeah. All of That's these right. industries that we are bonding. Um, and um, some of them have come back now, mm -hmm. but not to the levels they were, right, at this point, at least from the credit rating agencies. It's always easier for the credit rating agencies to downgrade and yeah. always much harder. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to be longer they're term. Cautious. They're, cautious yeah, they're cautious to, to increase them. Is there any concern there? We talk about now maybe a looming recession. Mm -hmm. um, and, and is there concern again as we sit here now? We're, we're sort of, I'm not going to say, we're, we're well, we're, I wasn't going to say the pandemic's over because we're living with it, or at least we're living with COVID. Right. Um, but the, the massive effect of COVID now that we're living with it is sort of waning, I guess. But now we, we have this recession maybe looming as we sit here now. Interest rates are going up. Your mortgage rate that was at historic lows, right, mm -hmm. of 2.5%, 3 that whatever they were today, what they said at six, seven percent, mm -hmm. right? Now, of course, it depends where you sit. If you talk to my father, and he's eighty-three tomorrow, <laughs> he'll remember that yep. well, we had what were they? 15, 17, yeah, 22 that was, that was percent. Right. Yeah, yeah, six was, percent was cheap right. money, money at that time. Right, that's right. Right. cheap money. Um, so, so, so with interest rates increasing, how do you see that 
maybe we'll take a, a minute to look forward now with your clients and concerns and how that affects your underwriting mm -hmm. and your deploying capacity. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting, Matt, like you're right. So during the pandemic, you know, the businesses just seized up. So there was no revenue coming in and then it started to improve. So we came in, this is a very interesting year. So we came into 2022, you know, things were growing at about 6%, the economy in the U.S. Interest rates were zero, right? And things seemed to be, you know, and COVID was waning. You know, as we leave, we have you know, growth maybe in the low, you know, mid ones. We have cost of money at, you know, five, six percent. Um, so it's changed dramatically from March really until, you know, until we're now in December. So, you know, I think obviously as an underwriter, what you think about is like, well, what companies are going to be most affected by the cost of borrowing, right? As, you know, Tim alluded to. Um, and then which ones will just benefit from redirecting of money, whether it's to construction industry, whether it's heavy civil versus residential, or whether, you know, it's the commercial where you're seeing more airlines benefit now and tech seems to be falling off for, for whatever reason. Um, so you try to play the trends a little bit, you know, but ultimately I think, you know, good surety underwriters underwrite solid balance sheets and, and the companies that we underwrite can kind of maneuver their way through bad and good cycles, right? So that's, you know, that's the way we're thinking about it now. But the refinancing is, I think, the biggest issue for like middle market companies, you know, that have smaller balance sheets that we're going to, the, the, you know, that cost of borrowing will really take a tear out of, uh, you know, their underwriting profit, I mean, their profitability. Mm -hmm. Tim? Yeah, and, um, you know, I think, the, I think one of the at least good things right now with the downturn that we're seeing um, from an economic standpoint is really driven by inflation and, and what you're when you're talking about interest rates rising, um, it was really because we needed to get inflation under control. Right. And, you, and you think about, you know, if you're in any, if you're building a building and you're three years out on buying, on, on buying materials for that building, you need to have some predictability of what that cost is going to be. If you're in the insurance industry like we are and you're setting reserves based on policies that you're selling today, you need to have some understanding of what that might look like three, four, five years down the road. And with inflation, uh, it just has such a negative impact on so many, so many industries. So the good thing is that I don't think we're looking at uh, an, an economic situation. You have multiple variables that, that are uh, trying to be uh, contained. It's really mm -hmm. the inflation part of it. And mm -hmm. I think if we address the inflation, uh, I think we'll fairly rapidly start to see the uh, at least the U.S. economy pick up pretty uh, pretty quickly because I do think there's still a, a, a lot of pent up demand um, within uh, the housing sector, mm -hmm. uh, within the construction sector. I mean, sure. we're going to have to do a lot more from a manufacturing standpoint. And I, and I think one of the things that the pandemic kind of sent a, a warning shot out about is this global concept of globalization. And uh, I don't know that it's th that everybody's enamored with the concept of globalization uh, as yeah. we might have been, say, five years ago or, or, or 10 years ago. And there's a, a lot more discussion about nearshoring, you know, building right. building facilities a lot closer to where you're, mm -hmm. uh, exactly right. you know, where you're located so that, um, uh, you know, there's more predictability in the in the supply of, uh, of whatever it is that, that you need. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like computer chips, right? Yep. Right? Yep. And that's a that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. And, and speaking of that, I mean, there's probably I don't know, it, at least it, just what I remember that, that there's got to be 50 to 60 billion dollars worth of chip manufacturing uh, construction mm -hmm. that is going to take place That's over right. the next uh, couple of years. And then you look at uh, the uh, the battery yeah. uh, uh, right. manufacturing facilities, and you right. see that, see the, right. you know, tens of billions of dollars that's, that's going into that. So you start right. thinking about some of the spending just in the construction sector. It's, it, it it's pretty big, a leading indicator of industries yeah. that are pretty bullish on where they're headed. Yeah, cloud, I mean, the other one we see a lot of is like this, you know, the cloud storage, the warehousing and the uh, data centers, you know, yeah. that that has been very resilient and continues to grow because they just, uh, they're just, there's this voracious appetite for data and people keep storing it, right? Whether it's you know, crypto or, or if it's, you know, just your mm -hmm. phone or your picture. So, um, but Tim's right, I mean, it's just, there's so much pent up now and some of it might be slower to get to it because if there's, 
interest sensitive construction spending, mm -hmm. they might wait a little bit, but ultimately they'll, they want what they want and they're gonna figure out how to get it. You know, So they're always very creative at that, I always find. So the good thing about the federal government spending is they're not so interest sensitive. So they, that right. will help you know, right. keep us uh, you know, at least afloat for the time being. Right. Yeah. Tim, can you tell us about, we talked about losses and was there gonna be a higher frequency and severity of losses um, now that we reflect on these two years, how's that panned out for Liberty? Yeah, so um, really it, it's been a relatively uh, benign loss environment. Um, you know, what we are seeing right now is a little bit of this on the smaller uh, uh, construction side. We're starting to see a little bit of um, uh, increased activity from a claim standpoint, and, and I kind of look at it as the, the PPP money's kind of run out, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and now, um, you know, there's some impacts of, of uh, the uh, supply chain and, and, and challenges with material, maybe a little bit of challenge around, around labor, so that's kind of kind of culminating in a little bit more of an activity, uh, claims activity from a small contractor standpoint. Beyond that, um, you know, one thing I did I did predict is that severity would become more of an issue, and, mm -hmm. and I still think that it will, um, because as you you know we talked a little bit earlier about some of the sizes of these contracts that are construction contracts that are out there, whether it's the chip manufacturing or the battery manufacturing, um, some of the transportation mm -hmm. infrastructure that, that you're seeing. Um, some pretty substantial dollars, and if something goes wrong, it's going to be it's, it's going to be big dollars. So, yeah. I haven't seen it yet, Matt, mm -hmm. but uh, but definitely think that that's a, a risk that's out there. But maybe you're a little surprised. You thought maybe there would be more during this period. We did. Yeah. De definitely anticipated uh, that there would be a little bit more activity than than we we've, we've seen for sure. Um, yeah. But um, again, I kind of go back to the the PPP uh, loan yeah. money. Right. I think it just kind of. You know, if you think about kicking the can down the road a little bit, I, I think I think that's exactly what happened with yeah, the uh, right, uh, with the government intervention that, that we saw in the in the liquidity markets. It just seems to me that we've always found we think of the last recession, 08, whatever that was, um, and we always thought the con oh no contractors are going to go down right. There's no work. We're going to have contractors. How are they going to stay in business? And the resilience of companies right. to me for our, what we've seen with clients is remarkable. Yeah. Um, and you always, you don't want to bet, you're not betting against them, but you're, and you're rooting for them, but you, you just, you, you sit there and go, how's this going to work? Yeah. Right. You know, and I'll let Steve comment, but two things that, that come to mind there, Matt, when you, you, you look at the capital that's been generated over the last decade, what are publicly, com what are publicly traded companies doing? I mean, they're basically, some are paying dividends and never paid dividends before, and a lot of them are buying back stock, stock. because That's they right. just don't have things to invest in. And then you look at the construction sector, and those that have done, done it the right way, they have built up some pretty significant capital yeah. in their companies over the last decade. Mm -hmm. And the work's there for them, for the contractors. It, it, Again, yeah. Yeah. another yeah. bit of a surprise, right, yeah. that it keeps on going. Yep. Major projects, major infrastructure projects, stadiums, you name it. Um, school renovations, it just it just keeps going. Yeah, the more than maybe it. we thought it was. Yeah, the country definitely needs uh, the infrastructure. I mean, you see a lot of money on highway, right? So the bill got passed, the one point five trillion dollars. So that's the first step, and then the appropriations. Like now, you have to find spots to put the money. Federal highway is pretty easy. That money is like readily. There's always projects going on. And then the whole green space, you know, with regard to batteries, which Tim alluded to, mm -hmm. um, and then the, you know, the I, you know, basically the IRA, the you know, basically pulling back onshoring again. That's going to do with the, the chip manufacturing, so that creates opportunities, and then construction can kind of lead you out of like maybe a softer environment, and that's what they're hoping for. But Tim's right, like we haven't seen you know systemic loss. It's been isolated. Um, it has been like kind of on the smaller side. The PPP money definitely, you know, that balanced everything out because it just gave people, when they didn't have to pay it back, it gave them equity to kind of forestall and to cover up mistakes. It'll, it'll run out. And then, and then you're always worried about as, as the government ramps up and money gets starting to flow heavily again, that people maybe take on a little bit too much work and then their labor or some other circumstances cause them to fail and then it has a trickle on effect. We haven't seen it, but that's what you're always worried about. So mm -hmm. um, 
So we'll see how the next, you know, we'll call it 12 to 24 months plays out. It's interesting you talk about when you talk about battery storage, because we've seen bond requests for mm -hmm. development sure. of them and then the actual construction um, in the, could be in the middle of nowhere, right? Okay. And, um, but it, it seems to be more and more prevalent as, there, as, as the battery storage becomes an alternative form that's, of energy, an right. important one. It yeah, is I because can't. they need that battery storage for the alternate energy like solar and wind because they need to be able to generate it and store it without that, and then they have to connect it to the grid. So that's a big part of what you're going to see, and there's obviously money dedicated to that that you're yeah. going to see spent over the next few years. Yeah. Right, right. Everyone's yeah. worried about the grid. Yep. So you need, well, look, you just got a, you're in generator, right? You, you had to get a generator. <laughs> well, you have to get your generator. if we go back to when we did this the first time, I, my phone, my power went yeah. out of the house and I had to use my phone. So I subsequently decided <laughs> that that wasn't going to happen again. So yes, people are taking energy uh, seriously. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we were involved in an interesting project in, in California earlier this year, and it's basically uh, building a uh, battery-powered standby energy-generating facility uh, for Pacific Gas and Electric. Mm -hmm. So um, clearly you see exactly what you just talked about. You see that app, uh, that uh, battery alternative energy source coming into play and, and, mm -hmm. and actually being invested in uh, as a way going forward there. So I think we'll see, I think we'll see a lot more of that. Right. For, what Ford announced, they're, they're building a $5 billion That's right. uh, battery manufacturing plant um, in uh, somewhat rural Tennessee. Um, and then I think uh, yeah. uh, General Motors is talking about a similar size That's facility right. uh, in Northern Ohio. So I think we'll continue to see those kind of uh, really big projects coming out in the uh, uh, in the construction sector. And by the way, as a plug for the audience, if you do go back to our previous session from June 3rd, 2020, which is on our website, suretybond.com, you will see Steve kind of going in and out. Yes. Tim and I were a little <laughs> nervous. Do we, when do we step <laughs> in right. because we can't yeah. hear him? That's right. It was pretty good. And then my pa the power went out in our office, so I had to shuffle and scramble and go to my house. And, and do it from the house right. because uh, we lost power. But we made it work. Storms we definitely made it work. Through. So we yeah. made it work. Today it's sunny and calm. That's right. Tim flew in from Boston, and it was, uh, it was easy, fortunately. It all worked out. Um, switching gears. So, again, going back to 2020 when we met, um, the market, we, hard to argue. It's, it's a softer, it was back then a softer surety market. Pricing was soft. Um, some would argue underwriting was softer. Um, you have a lot of players in the marketplace, surety players in the last several years who entered, mm -hmm. who find it very, um, look at it as a very profitable uh, business. I mean, Tim, if we go back to when Safeco and Liberty Mutual came together, I always like that interesting statistic. If I recall, it was something like, Safeco surety, which is where Tim came from, he was the Safeco surety side when Liberty and Safeco came together, and um, and you are, by the way, I think the longest term president in the surety industry out there that we, that I know of. I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I mean, Steve, uh, Steve, Steve might Steve might have me on on, on that. So. I nipped him because Did uh, you? well, Mike Peters was. Uh, I think Tim was. I forget. I remember we were we were, we were actually playing golf, and I think yeah, uh, Tim kind of got the nod and had to leave an event to go. And I think I was in the job for maybe one or two years. So I might have. I might have. Uh, Short change. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think you got right. me about yeah, yeah. a couple years. I think I might have. I think of Steve as the young underwriter. <laughs> back in the day. And you should. You really, yeah. that's the way I should always be thought of. Is this but they're both dramatically different companies that we led at the time versus the companies that we, yes. that, that, that we lead now, now, for it's sure. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But but just as an aside, if we talk about the industry, Safeco Surety um, represented, and you, you'll correct me with these numbers, but I believe it was something like of the pro 30, at one year, 33% or something of Safeco insurance companies' profits. Yeah, it was it was a pretty significant a pretty significant percentage. Uh, you know, Safeco was a uh, largely a personal lines insurance company, so uh, it kind of followed. Number one, the margins weren't very very big to begin with, That's and true. then yeah. you know it kind of followed the cycle from an underwriting standpoint, where um, uh, surety could become a, a pretty significant contributor to the to the profitability of the company for sure. 
And so that was an important piece that Liberty yeah. was buying was yeah. the surety business, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then interestingly, if we, we go to your history, Ace and Chubb came together. Yeah. You were the Ace side. That's true. Coming yep. into Chubb. Uh, but Ace surety was a, a big uh, part of the uh, the book of business. I mean, that was coming together. Yeah, I mean, it was a it was an, a, a good blend because you had a largely like Tim alluded to, like we were largely commercial uh, focused at Ace, and Chubb had a very mature uh, construction book. So putting the two together worked very well. Um, but going back to the industry, what Tim was alluding to, and what you were alluding to, Matt, is that you know the surety industries delivered. I'm going to say a combined ratio of 70 over the last 10 years. So that means you're delivering 30 cents. And if you probably look at the top five, it's probably a little better. Um, and then when you look at the underwriting profitability contributed to the, you know, our companies, it's been like, you know, it, it varies of course by company, but it's been pretty substantial relative to very small amount of like what I'll call premium writing. So like direct written premium is probably like one, 2%. And then you deliver this underwriting profitability based on margin. So, it, I always tell people when I talk internally, like that's what we focus on. Just like you know, you have to be a good underwriting, you know, you have to deliver the margin because the top line it doesn't move the needle in, in the PNC world. Talk a little bit for those who don't know about the combined ratio. Why is that? What is it exactly, and, and why is it important? It's, yeah, so there's two large components to it. its loss, right, which generally you peg, you, you plan for, and then your expense ratio, which for most of us, brokerage commission is probably one of the larger components, reinsurance. And then the cost of paying your people, and then there's mm -hmm. other, of course, real estate and other things. But those components, when you put them together, you know, you get your combined ratio, and and that sort of benchmarks you against your other, um, you know, product lines within in the company. And, and generally, surety, you know, because it's not really supposed to have very many losses, will outperform, you know, like casualty or the other lines property because they have. To Tim's point, they have very cyclical, you know, patterns. While you know, you have a year where you get a wildfire, you get a large hurricane that affects their results. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, generally we we don't have that same phenomenon. All right. So the PNC business going into uh, back at going back to 2020, that was a hardening market, and. Um, and, and I'm a surety guy, so I'm not as much of an insurance guy. You, and while you're surety folks, I know you're very in tune to what your, the rest sure. of your company's doing. But it seems that in talking to our clients, it's still a hard market on the PNC insurance side, and therefore the, that affects the reinsurance side, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet the surety side, where are we today? How does the reinsurance market, and by the way, we were talking about reinsurance, so insurance companies in, lay off some of their risk with reinsurers reinsurance companies, insuring insurance companies. So, um, and they, each company, just, you decide um, in different lines how much reinsurance you're going to take on, how much you need, or how much you want as a philosophy, right? And, and that, that also changes, right, year to year potentially. Um, so where, where is the reinsurance market for surety right now? And how does the overall PNC market if it does affect the surety market and, and, and your pricing and how much you can deploy out there capacity. Yeah, and I'll, I'll start there. I'd say, you know, the, the surety reinsurance market is really strong because as we've talked, you know, it's been a, it's, it's been a, um, a, a pretty uh, quiet loss environment that, that we've been in. Um, so there's a lot of capacity from a reinsurance side uh, some really consistent players. There's probably a dozen that I would say are really consistent players from a surety reinsurance standpoint. And then there's a whole bunch of others that that are kind of trying to get into the get into the industry and or into the uh, surety reinsurance sector. And you think about it for number one, you look at property from a global property standpoint. Uh, it, it's generated just uh, tremendous losses over mm -hmm. uh, the last uh, three, four, five years, and a lot of that's just driven by things that we can't change quickly, like climate, the, the, right. the effects of, of climate change and the severity of of, of weather and, and, and natural disaster right. events. So, uh, you know, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of opportunity for reinsurers want to be in that big property uh, reinsurance market. So they're looking for different ways to put. Uh, capacity into segments of the business that right. uh, right. where they have a chance of making money, and right now, uh, you know, property just doesn't look like there, there's much of an opportunity to make much money in the property sector, given the severity that's just been unprecedented in any of the the, the property events that have happened globally. Yeah, we're seeing yeah, companies decide to because it's so expensive, they're just 
using a strictly cat loss and taking big deductibles. <clears throat> and if they're giant companies, I mean, 10, 20, 40 million dollar deductibles because it's so expensive. Yeah. It can be yeah. so expensive. Right? Yeah. Not everyone has that luxury. And if you're in a construction company, you don't have the luxury to take on um, super large deductibles, but depending on the size, you might take on larger ones than you would otherwise to, yeah. to combat that. That's right, yeah. What, what else would you say I mean, about I, that? You know, Tim's right. I mean, look, there's there's like a core market that sort of participates and provides capacity, and then there's ones that are opportunistic that kind of come in and out depending on circumstances. You know, obviously, they're all one companies, um, so they are affected by the property market and their capital is. so. They try to move it around in order to get the best return. So, but right now the surety reinsurance market is, uh, given the the lack of loss activity, has been pretty stable. You know, um, you know, twenty was obviously a little bit of a anxiety year because nobody knew again how pan the pandemic was going to play out. So was, there was some cost increases then. But by the time you got into twenty one renewal, most people were pretty confident that that wasn't going to develop into something catastrophic. And this year it was, you know, costs, you know, are going up a little bit, but not as much as, you know, people would have anticipated, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And the anxiety, Steve, you and, you and I yesterday talked about Fieldwood, and yep. Tim, we were talking about it. Um, that created some anxiety in the industry, right? Can, it did. Can, can either of you talk about what the concern was and what Fieldwood was an interest? It's an interesting case, right, of how it potentially changed the surety, um, how surety's looked at by the courts? Yeah, so, you know, I'd say some of the interesting aspects of that, number one, you know, it was a fairly significant size capacity yeah. for the industry. Um, and then you had a lot of um, what I would say some of the, you know, maybe not all the the top five were had capacity on a company like Fieldwood. So you had some of the smaller sureties that did have some capacity there. And that's a much bigger uh, potential impact to their mm -hmm. right. uh, to, to their P&L. Uh, when they have a decent size amount of capacity, uh, but don't have the revenue to, to, to spread that over. So um, that was one of the dynamics that I, I think was um, was interesting about mm -hmm. about Fieldwood. For uh, for those of us that, that, that did have some exposure on Fieldwood, it's kind of a traditional commercial That's surety right. loss to a certain extent, um, although you know, when you reserve it and when you actually pay ends up being a, a pretty big gap because there's a lot, you just don't have a lot of control over when that ultimate demand is gonna, is gonna take place. So mm -hmm. uh, at least from a cash flow standpoint, you have time to prepare for it. Um, it's not like where you see a construction company uh, start to go down and you may get a phone call That's and right. you gotta help gotta make payroll on a Friday and it might be a Wednesday. So you gotta, you, you gotta re uh, react a lot quicker. In the case of the Fieldwood, uh, even though there's a lot of exposure out there, there's been a, a, a decent amount of time to kind of spread that over yeah, a few right. years and get prepared for kind of when that ultimate cash event might uh, might take place. Right. right. Yeah, and I think you were alluding to, Matt, Tim, Tim's spot on. I mean, it was it is a very normal type of obligation that people would bond. Um, but I think the rub that you were alluding to is a lot of people previously underwrote those as portfolios with the idea that if there was a failure, the company sort of that comes out of that bankruptcy would still have the responsibility to clean up the, uh, you know, the old wells. And what we quickly learned was that they were able to kind of, you know, bifurcate, take the good wells and leave you with the bad wells, which changed the underwriting philosophy and strategy. So then you couldn't just do a portfolio. You had to do very specific well by well by well based on the livelihood yep. of the well, right? So I think, I think that was a big difference. And, and at the time, I mean, Fieldwood failed because we, we talked about this earlier that, you know, the price of oil just dropped dramatically and it made it untenable for them to generate revenue. And now you fast forward and a lot of the delayed loss activity that the industry is benefiting is because the prices are high and those wells have economic value. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to shift to construction a little bit because I, I do want to talk a little bit more about construction. I mean... What would you say represents how much of your surety? So it, it's about a 60-40 split between, um, and, that, and, that, and I'm taking an international out for the moment, right? right? So in North America, you know, it's about 60% construction, 40%, and that's right. based on uh, on premium, right? right. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's benefited the most, um, I would say, in this environment just because there, 
you know, there was the pause in 20 and everyone was biting their nails and then we, we were deemed essential and then it started to pick up again. But remember, while the uh, pandemic was going on, governments were not getting revenue. So a lot of the state budgets were in jeopardy. And now what we're seeing is really with the new president, they kind of recapitalized the states almost and now money was starting to you know, just be spent. So some projects that were sort of either delayed or stalled a little bit, they're coming back online. So we saw a big, this year, you, you saw a big pickup in growth in the construction segment. So, which is, which is great. I mean, um, like I said, again, it, it can lead us out of, you know, economic, you know, difficulties. So, but that's what, that's kind of what we're seeing now. And really, I would say for 23 and 24, we're, we would expect our, um, our construction book to grow faster than our commercial book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I have similar comments. We're, we're about 60-40 construction uh, commercial uh, as well from our uh, premium standpoint. If you look at the SFAA numbers through the third quarter, uh, premium for the industry yeah, was dropped. up about 13 and a half percent, which yeah, just, at, least, have, at least in our, I haven't our seen that very <laughs> often to be honest with you. Yeah. 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 And, and, and it's largely been driven, like Steve said, uh, by the construction sector and by the contract mm -hmm. sector. Um, some of that's pent up demand for, for projects that, that maybe got on hold, uh, when there was a little uncertainty around COVID. So that's part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, material prices have driven up yeah, some, sure. uh, s some of the cost of, uh, of, of, of the projects as, as well. So you're benefiting from that. Um, and then just as we've talked a little bit earlier, just the, the, the sheer number uh, or the uh, projects that are substantial in size and let's say, uh, it used to be something over a hundred million dollars was a big, was a big project. And, and, and now that's almost, uh, almost a routine project anymore right. when you start yeah. to see um, some of the billion dollar plus projects that, uh, that are out in the marketplace. We're also, along those lines, we're seeing some more uh, frequency of design build mm -hmm. projects. And it used to be back in the day when we were young underwriters, design build, like, oh, I don't know about that. Uh, you know, this is a whole nother level of engineers and getting the stamp and, now it seems to me the surety industry understands the design build uh, concept and bonding it much uh, better than they did many many years ago. Um, where are you? What are you seeing out there with design build? Are you seeing more frequency like we are of it? So it's, it's a it's a it's a topic we could we could spend you know all afternoon yeah. talking about. But but project delivery uh, is a uh, ha has been a challenge, and the, but to your point, Matt, the day, the days of the you know kind of design it, bid it, and then build it are pretty much gone. I mean, maybe for some of the smaller projects, you might see right. some of, some of that, and design build or design assist or mm -hmm. a progressive design build. Yeah. There's a lot. There's right. a so lot it of it different. Depends how you're going to define right. that. There's, term. there's right. a lot of different different variations of it, but but you're absolutely right. We're starting to see much more in the way of kind of alternative project delivery by owners versus the traditional old way of of de having the owner design it. The contractors bid it, and then you go, and then you go build it, and and that's kind of, I think that'll continue to evolve because, you know, especially the you know, most of the publicly traded construction companies where you can get uh, public news on things, some of these bigger projects just have not performed very well no. from a uh, from a financial standpoint, and um, and it's a lot of it's been driven by the way uh, maybe there's some risk allocation uh, challenges, but there's also been some project delivery challenges that uh, that, that um, needed to change. And, and I think we're gonna need to see that continue to change for um, there to be a strong market to, to actually ultimately build some of those those big projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Tim, Tim I, I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, yeah. maybe you'll see more joint venturing just because the balance sheets will yep. wanna share some of the, uh, the, you know, the risk appetite, you know, which is not uncommon and probably quite, you know, welcome and it helps alleviate some of the concerns that we would have in, in delivery and also the design aspect of the, of the projects. But look, it's not without its challenges. We, we know that, but for the most part, um, you know, we'll see how, if they do better over the next, uh, you know, I'll call it three to five years, right? But they all have said the larger Ian 
you know, ENR, ENC contracts said they were going to change the way they approach these bigger, yeah. more complex projects. Well, you know, we, that still has to be kind of tested. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Along those lines of complex projects and how you define it, P3, mm -hmm. public private partnership, um, or is it private public partnership? I forget which private, one goes private, first. Public. Private, yeah. Yeah. That was what I was going to say. But I, left, I led with public. But anyway, private-public partnerships, P3 projects. What is your um, philosophy on that as far as underwriting it and, and, and bonding it? Um, it seems that what we often see is they start out as a P3 concept, at least it was a P3 concept, and then they realize the cost, the public sector realize the cost of it, and then they... They create some modification of it, and and then it sort of breaks apart. I mean, you still have the concessionaire, you still have the builder, and and the public owner. But um, where do you see P three going now, as as it's been evolving and developing? Yeah, it's a good question, um, especially because I think Matt, if I would have gone back five years ago, I would have thought that P three would be much more prominent as a project delivery and project finance uh, uh, mechanism. But, uh, you know. it's going to be the wave of the future. Everything. Yes, yeah. Sure. We're going to pay for all these projects. We're going to have all yep. these roads and these and these hospitals, or whatever yep. it is. Canada was doing it. Other, right. inter, other yep. countries are doing yep. it more than we were. Surely we were going to do more of this. International companies come in to show us how to do it, I guess. Yeah. Contractors. Yeah, right. And then so. And it, and, it, and it just really, I'm not going to say they haven't happened. There, there are definitely some uh, out there. And there's some segments. For example, um, student housing seems to be mm -hmm. one area where, where, where there's, so it's more yes, social yeah. infrastructure than what we traditionally considered transportation infrastructure. Mm -hmm. The transportation infrastructure just has not taken off the way that I would say that um, uh, many thought that it mm -hmm. would if you go back if you go back five years ago. So I'm still a little hesitant to see where where that market's gonna kind of go. I, I, I think five years from now maybe you see a slight uptick in um, some of the public private partnership stuff, but you know with the you know the the, the uh, transportation funding that's coming out mm -hmm. from the federal government and the states are all uh, increasing their budgets as well. There, there seems to be plenty of money, money. in that yeah. space to build the infrastructure, and there's not necessarily a need for third-party capital mm -hmm. to come in to, uh, to to assist and more expensive yeah. Yeah. projects. Yeah, right. Now that, that I mean, Tim's right. I mean, is to the extent that they have the money, I don't think they they don't, they don't want the partnership. They just right. want what they want. They rather <laughs> do it themselves. Um, and and we've seen the same thing, like student housing, where there's predictable revenue because you know kids are always going to yep. college, <laughs> and that we thought transportation would be one, but they there's been some. Some high level, you know, I'll call it, you know, problems with some of them that just haven't panned out. But it, it is, it is definitely not as uh, pronounced as we thought it was. Like, you know, you're right, like even look five to seven years ago, everyone thought this was going to be the wave because it was, you know, it was an easier way of financing these projects. And then you're correct, like a lot of the Europeans were going to come, they were going to bring the financing to do it. And they had that model because it was very prevalent in Europe. It just hasn't, hasn't mm -hmm. gotten traction. You know, you think about a lot of the bridges we have in the country are toll bridges. And hey, in the if you go back 10 years ago, there was always going to be 50,000 cars right. a day and growing right. go, going across that bridge. And then the pandemic hits, That's the right. work from home hit. And all of a sudden, it's not 50,000 cars going across that, going That's across right. that bridge yeah. every day. So mm -hmm. some of the predictability of uh, revenue flow uh, was really disrupted by uh by the by COVID and then kind of the the after effects of COVID of where we are right now in uh, uh, working in office versus working from home environment. You're right; it's changed, but yet it feels like whether you're in New York or Philadelphia or LA or wherever, going into the city on a Friday or Saturday night or or a Thursday, there's lots of people out all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's three and four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. I mean, it's sort of spread out the traffic and, and then therefore all the revenue coming. But I'd like to switch to international surety. 
maybe you could talk about what percentage of your business, because because I consider Chubb Surety um, always has been tried and true international surety bond market with offices and people there, and I consider Liberty, in my opinion, you guys can you can talk separately about growing more and more of the last whatever you want to time frame five years, seven years. Uh, more and more into the um, international surety marketplace, seeing that as a growth, uh, as potential growth for uh, business. Um, how to, and, and then also, if I, we reflect back from our 2020 interview, mm -hmm. um, Steve, we talked about uh, Mexico and Brazil. Mm -hmm. The economies were a little, weren't, weren't as bad as they, we thought they would be, but still stressed. Um, from a surety standpoint, Brazil is a lot of tax appeal bonds. Mm -hmm. it seems to be the majority of the bonds. Mexico, you both have a presence in Mexico for writing bonds. Um, so, I don't know, Tim, maybe you want to start? Uh, sure. So, uh, about 25% of our revenue would be uh, international. And, um, you know, Liberty Mutual is a, a, a global company. We're in 22 or 23 countries around the world. So, we don't necessarily, uh, from a surety standpoint, um, you know, go into a country uh, on our own and kind of do do our own thing. Typically, typically, Liberty is uh, is in the in a particular market uh, already, and um, so you know, you, you got a little bit of the understanding of the uh, uh, of the economics, the legal aspect of a of a particular country, and if there's a surety opportunity there, uh, we we take a we take a hard look at it, and as, as you. Mentioned uh, Brazil, Mexico, uh, Canada, uh, Italy, uh, probably the largest surety, surety markets. Um, and then the rest of Europe is, um, yeah, it's a little bit London centric. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just the kind of the way yep. insurance, you know, complex specialty insurance was bought. But that, that's changing. That's changing a little bit. But, you know, the rest of, the, the, the rest of Europe um, if you look at the Netherlands, the Belgium, I mean, we're the, the largest writer of, of surety in both those uh, countries uh, based on an acquisition that, that we made. Um, and then, you know, France and, uh, and, and Spain and some of the other, what I'd say, Western European countries, just, just not, I would say, a real dynamic surety market. You have to be a little bit oppor opportunistic when deals, when deals come your way. Mm -hmm. um, the distribution side of it, what you do, doesn't really exist that strongly in, uh, in, in, in Western Europe either. So it's just a little bit of a different, a different dynamic uh, there. Latin America, you, you know, it's still, my opinion, there's still a tremendous amount of opportunity in, in, in Latin America. And, and one of the things I'd say you're starting to see in those markets where surety has been around a little bit is the, um, the value of the bonds, the percentage of the bond is starting to increase a, a little bit. You know, when you're at 10% from a, you know, from a guarantee standpoint, if you have a problem, the only party that's happy about it is the surety because they can write a check and walk away. Right. Whoever else is pretty disappointed because it doesn't cover the, the damages that might have that, that might have taken place. So um, and then you look at, uh, you know, the Latin American, uh, the countries for the most part are pretty doggone rich from a uh, natural resources standpoint, whether that's oil, whether that's other precious metals and mine in, in, in uh, materials. Um, the challenge you have there is obviously the political environment's been a little bit, uh, been a little bit unstable, as we just saw with Peru here <laughs> within within the last week or so, where uh, the Peruvian uh, president decided to yeah. disband Congress and put his own put put his own government in place, uh, and, and fortunately that got uh, that got suppressed pretty quickly. But it, it's it's that kind of challenge uh, mm -hmm. that, that you that you have to be. Uh, comfortable with on the international side, and then to me, Southeast or eight, the whole Asia Pac area, it, it's yet to be yet to be determined. Um, yeah, India is is thinking about uh, a surety uh, market, but um, that would that's going to be years in the in the making. Uh, you see a little bit of activity in um, in Australia, um, and you know South Korea. Is, Certainly, a uh, nationalized surety market. If that changes, might open up some opportunities. But anyhow, I mean, that's a little bit of a trip around the world, and I'd, yeah. I'd love to hear 
Steve's comments on it, on it as well. But uh, I think there's opportunity there, Matt. It's just you have to be pretty patient um, and you have to think about it from the, from the long term standpoint. Um, if you're gonna if you're gonna gonna yeah. be successful in the uh, in the various international segments, I think it'd be interesting. Just a couple points you made just for the audience. Um, you, you referenced ten uh, percent bonds, for example, in certain countries in Latin America. Um, in the U.S., the vast majority of the bonds we write are a hundred percent of the bond amount, um, or of the contract amount, or of the guarantee in commercial bonds. Whereas in most of the rest of the world, it is a percentage um, of the guarantee. And um, so if you had a contract that was $100 million, uh, depending on the country, it might only be a 10% or 20% bond. And so your liability is, is very different. And that's just per jurisdiction yeah. Yeah. as how they decide. That's right. Um, yeah, so I mean, from a percentage perspective, it's about the same as Tim. I mean, we're about like maybe twenty-two percent of the overall, you know, premium writings for, um, you know, for Chubb Surety come out, you know, from outside the United States. Um, and then, you know, look, we we've gone at it, you know, from the perspective of Matt. You said like, you know, Chubb's always been considered international. We, you know, we've always had a presence in the UK. Uh, we, you know. What we're trying to do is create that network, right, so that we can facilitate clients because we, we, we view it as a global business and, you know, clients in Germany might need bonds in Brazil, you know, Brazilian clients might need, you know, in the U.S. So we, can, we have that network to facilitate. And then, of course, you know, some of the market, the domestic markets, to Tim's point, are bigger uh, and they can still grow, right? Right now, I think, you know, I think last time I was concerned about Brazil and, and Mexico, you know, they were both in, you know, coming into, they were in recession, really, and then the pandemic on top of that. Um, you know, you don't see a lot of infrastructure spending right now going on in either country, which is disappointing, right? You see, like you said, judicial bonds, which is about 85%. You know, we have change in government in Brazil, but largely they're still constrained on what they can spend for infrastructure. So for the time being, we don't see any bright spots there. Mexico, a little different. You know, the, the current government there has the Train Maya, which is a big project. They also have, you know, a big refinery that they're doing in next year, Monterey, um, which is one of the largest cities is going to, you know, do a transit project. So that's big. But outside of that, that's about it. And then, you know, as you go around into Europe, you know, they, they have their own issues right now with just regards with the Ukraine crisis, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that there's, um, you know, inflation going on. Um, so it's making it difficult them to spend money. But... You know, we, to Tim's point, we're there for the long term. You know, so we're just trying to find the opportunities that are, you know, developing in the current, you know, economic climate, and, and support them for good clients. Um, and then when you look at, you know, Asia, Tim's comments were, were spot on. I mean, like I don't really know much about the Indian market. Most of the Chinese business is outbound, right? You know, out, you know, either going into Latin America or going into Europe or going into the U.S. And then Australia is a smaller market that, you know, where there's a few, you know, a few market participants and it's been pretty stable. And, you know, it's had lost activity, but for the most part, it's, you know, it's done, it's done well. So, um, and personally, I was surprised when you told me you're writing um, a, some business in Saudi Arabia. We would see some of our clients coming out of Europe that would go into Saudi. Uh, and what we generally try to do, because that's not really... It's more of a banking market. We would use some of our bank partners to front for us, um, and that does uh, help with our distribution, right? right. Um, you know, and, and then our largest premium outside the United States comes from Mexico. You know, we made the acquisition of Fianzas Monterey in 2011, um, and Brazil was probably, you know, the next largest, and that was a big, you know, at one time, both those markets were very big markets, like, you know, 600 million, 500 million, um, Unfortunately, they, they've gotten a little a little softer over the years, but they have the potential because, like Tim said, they're rich in natural resources. There's a lot they can offer the world. We're just waiting for that demand to come back online, and, and I think that'll help construction and just change to the you know the mix of business. Yeah, and if you go you know you go back five years ago again, um, I think the projections for the Latin American surety yeah, market, whereas it was going to be equal to what the United States surety market That's is, right. it has, hasn't gotten there. And uh, but to Steve's point, I think it will eventually. I think it will eventually get there because um, population 
uh, the population of those countries kind of want the same thing that uh, you know they see in the United States. You know, they mm-hmm. want to they, they want to en- enjoy life a little bit, and and um, they've got some money to spend because there's um, you know, some some decent uh, economic activity going on due to the uh, the natural resources that those countries have. And and Steve, you were also touching on uh, when we talked about Saudi um, in in Europe um, letters of credit. Are, are frequently used as a guarantee, and, and we see the opportunities in industry where we can to convince obligees to owners to use bonds. Right. But then we've also seen where they don't, won't use bonds, they still are stuck on a letter of credit. That's right. We are able to, and we are having success in using a surety-backed um, right. a letter of credit. There is some of that going on. A lot of the, uh, the obligees are unfamiliar uh, and the insurance companies in, in, in really in North America just don't have the brand recognition, mm-hmm. so they're more comfortable going to the banks, right? They're they're very familiar with the you know the big German, the big French banks, so they'll do that. And then what what we're trying to do when there's moments of time um, and not adverse selection, but actually participating on good risk where the banks want to either redeploy into something else um, where they can get more margin, and we can utilize our standby facility with them. To make you know some money, um, you know we've been doing that. Um, so it's grown, um, you know, and you know my my opinion has been it's been pretty successful. You know we've done we've had good success with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you see the same. same yes, yeah, so it's the same thing. I mean, it, it, it's a little bit a, a little bit of a you know you think about well you'd re- rather have surety bonds mm-hmm. uh, in place, but yeah. by uh, and by supporting the banks in, in uh, the situations that uh, Steve described, you know, maybe you're kind of adding a lot of continuity to the, that avenue as far as a guarantee versus a surety bond. But hey, that's what the market is. And, and I think as more um, uh, countries and companies become more familiar with surety, hopefully it picks up a little bit from, mm-hmm. from the standpoint of visibility. But right yeah, now, it's, right. A, it's a pretty good market uh, partnering with the, uh, with the banks. And interestingly, I, I believe, if my numbers are correct, the U.S. is still the predominant writer of surety bonds as a... Globally? Globally. Yes. And then after that, we get into, and I forget exactly the order, but Canada, Mexico, mm-hmm. Korea, right, is in, I believe, in the top five. Italy is in there, I think, yeah, as right. well. Yeah. Um, Korea is interesting. We're, we're actually writing another bond. We, we do it often, as you do. Um, another one in there, and, and sole guarantee is That's right. all the writers of surety at this point have to go right. through sole guarantee. Yeah. They can't go in on their own. And you have some other, there are not a lot of other countries where we have that, that I can think of, right? No, I mean, you used to have IRB in Brazil, but that got right. just you know, yeah. changed, so you don't really have that anymore. Um, uh, I we think maybe Italy, I, 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 not bit. that it's a popular country right now, but I think Russia has sort of the same <laughs> dynamic going on. But I don't yeah. think a lot of people is are your right revenue in. pretty big in Russia right <laughs> no, now. It's not, not right now. You don't see it as a growing. It's market. not a growth yeah. area for us, to yeah. be honest okay. with you. Last question: You may not have any other predictions out there for. Well, you know, I didn't touch on one thing. I will touch on one thing: yeah. technology, right? And, yeah. and I was thinking about that when we talked about Latin America because they seem to be more technologically advanced on their electronic bonding and their reporting and, than we are in the U.S. Um, wh- where are we going? I mean, you two have a, I would think, have your, um, you know, a sense of the pulse of, of where that is. Um, wh- where are we going as an industry in the, in, I'll, I'll focus in the U.S. on, yeah. on technology and electronic bonding and other technological advances, maybe even an underwriting in the surety industry. Well, uh, Tim, I mean, it came up at the uh, the last board meeting um, that, you know, there Which is... Which board meeting we're talking about for the I'm audience? I'm sorry, for the, board, <laughs> for the surety and fidelity board meeting, you know, we the the whole, it was a repository they were talking about, right? Yeah. I'll let, you know, Tim, Tim could take it, but it's something where, yeah, there, there's a lot of thought, and I think it's still kind of developing as to how it's going to be. Uh, yeah, Matt, and... I don't think there's anything out there that I would say w- would would be real transformative uh, to the to the in, to the industry. Number one, it's not it's not big enough to to, to mm-hmm. really have technology really disrupt the industry in a big way. But to yeah. to what 
Steve is talking to is, and, and you guys experience a lot more than we do, is just the archaic way of delivering a bond yeah. anymore where you got to have the wet signatures, you've got to have the seals, you've got to, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a very paper intensive process. And I think, I think the industry overall could benefit from, uh, from doing things a little bit more efficiently yeah. uh, than that. And I, I think, um, you know, COVID gave us the opportunity maybe to, uh, to change some mm -hmm. of the longstanding yeah. Uh, yeah. traditions and ways that surety were, were delivered. And hopefully we can pick up on that and through uh, blockchain technology and other technology, we can get to a point where we have a very efficient, secure and transparent way that we can deliver uh, surety bonds. And, and, and that's gonna have a positive impact on the broker side. It's gonna have a positive impact on all the, on all the companies as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, We've wrapped up another, I don't know, I think I took more of your time. I appreciate it. Uh, you've said a lot. I think a lot to digest here. Appreciate your time, your expertise. You guys have been doing this a long time and you know your business well. And um, and we appreciate you know you yeah. coming, making the effort to, to come here. You making the 30 minute drive, Steve, appreciate <laughs> I'm that. I'm happy to do it for you, Matt. Yeah. Thank you for inviting and, uh, me. Tim it's making a longer trip. Yeah. Uh, appreciate it and uh, hopefully we can do it again because I think it's interesting. It was really interesting watching the video and then now, you know, it'll be interesting seeing this and maybe in two and a half years we could do it again. Yeah, that sounds Perfect. great. Thank sounds you very much. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. Thank you.